All right, good morning, everyone. We are going to get started. Um, first of all, I would love um, to just say thank you for joining us. We're excited to have you all and we're excited to be partnering with ERC Pathlight uh, for this webinar. My name is Dana Slowinski and I am co-owner of Family Recovery Centers. I wanted to take just a minute to share a little bit about FRC. Um, we are an adolescent evening intensive outpatient program and we have locations in Lake Bluff, Hoffman Estates and St. Charles. Uh, we are a DBT based program, so we really work with a wide range of adolescents um, ranging from mood disorders, uh, anxiety, depression, bipolar disorder, and a wide range of maladaptive behaviors such as substance use, self-injury. Um, two program components I do like to highlight that we do have parent involvement. So parents are actually on site with their children uh, two of the four evenings. And so they're learning the skills right along with their child. And then they're also doing their own work. So we're really looking at their dynamics and their role um, within the family system so that we can address the whole family system. And then we also have a 24 seven on call. So our staff is available 24 seven to both patients and parents um, to provide in you know, their own environment skills coaching um, so that they can really you know, work through any urges, any um, you know, struggles that they're having with skill utilization. We can help them in their own environment, not just when they're in program with us. Um, and that is us in a very quick nutshell. If you do have more questions or want to talk further about FRC, I'm happy. Um, I, I believe you have my contact information along with Ryan. So please feel free to reach out uh, to talk more about FRC. And uh, Ryan and I are very grateful for community partnerships and our relationships with the ERC and Pathlight. And um, we do, you know, we really are grateful and we value those relationships with Jennifer and Leah. Um, and with that, I will turn it over. One thing I do want to note is that um, the, record, the presentation will be recorded and it will be posted on FRC's website. And so with your email, you should have gotten a link to that website. So if you do want to see the presentation again or to see the slides, please refer to our website. And with that, I will turn it over to, I believe, Leah. Good morning, everybody. Um, so uh, just briefly, Jennifer and I will talk a little bit about ERC and Pathlight and anxiety. Um, Jennifer, I'll let you kind of do that if you don't mind. All right, hello. Thank you so much for spending a couple hours with us this morning. Like thoroughly appreciate this opportunity and working with family recovery centers as well. Um, for those of you who may be have newer to eating recovery center, Pathlight Mood and Anxiety is we are through the majority of the states throughout the country and especially here in Illinois. Um, we do have a variety of programming. Um, first, I'll start with the Eating Recovery Center programming, which is gonna be those individuals who have a primary eating disorder diagnosis. And typically for a lot of them, they do have that secondary mood anxiety, um, PTSD, OCD diagnoses as well. Um, for both adults and adolescents at separate locations, we do have residential programming, partial hospital programming, and intensive outpatient programming. Um, the IOP is both on-site and virtual options in Illinois. Um, Il the Northbrook location actually holds the majority of our adolescent eating disorder programming from residential down to IOP and um, an integrative um, model and through resin PHP, we do continuity of care, which means they have the same psychiatrist, dietitian, therapist, case manager through resin PHP. And what, regardless of the age, family therapy is crucial to us. I'll be telling, talking to you a little bit about that um, further in the presentation. And so with our adolescents, we do anywhere from one to two family therapy sessions in the residential and PHP levels of care. Um, the um, Evanston location, oh, that's going to be moon anxiety. I'll get to that in a minute. Um, our downtown location off Huron and Michigan Avenue is adult eating disorders, and that does residential through IOP, very similar to Northbrook, but with adults only. We do, once again, have that continuity of care from res to PHP with the same individuals. And for those that live more than an hour away from downtown, we even have apartments. Um, They're kind of like dorm room living um, for patients that are a little bit further away or out of state to get access to those services. Um, downtown, we also have um, a binge eating specific PHP and IOP. Um, and we're also able to teach those who are binge eating or work with them primary in our residential level care as well. Um, we also 
have quite a bit of mood anxiety programming and that's under the name Pathlight. So we keep them same company, but we keep them a little bit separate to help um, with any confusion. And our Pathlight mood anxiety has residential and PHP um, and IOP all downtown for adult. They have child and adolescent PHP and IOP downtown. And then um, we also in some of our additional suburban locations, our Oakbrook location, does not have any residential, but has a little bit, has some PHP and IOP for adult and adolescent mood anxiety and eating disorder. They kind of have a little bit of everything at that location. And um, our Evanston location uh, is in the process of um, reopening. We work very closely with Northwestern and we are beginning with um, adult mood anxiety IOP at our Evanston location. Um, in addition, we do have, you may have guessed by the title of population, Population. We do work with substance as a secondary diagnosis as well, and our ARCH program is the acronym. Um, for that, I'll let Leah take that, and then we'll get started. That's because nobody can remember what ARCH stands for. <laughs> um, I can uh, if so, I have another cup of coffee. Yeah, <laughs> totally understood. Uh, so yeah, we do offer, I'm the clinical manager for our substance use integrated services, um, and we do offer um, anywhere, a minimum of education to the entire milieu, and that includes our adolescents. Um, and then we offer additional groups, and each program has kind of a different number of groups available to them. Um, but uh, yeah, the idea is to really support that um, secondary diagnosis, um, to uh, provide um, additional education, um, support, especially for those folks who are making an effort to try to be sober or abstinent, um, really working on people to try to at least explore their use of substances and um, start making some changes, whatever that might be. Um, and um, I'd also like to note that um, this is uh, outside of uh, what we do. Um, if anybody does have any questions during the presentation, just feel free to throw it in the chat or I get the Q&A here and Jennifer and I will address them as they pop up. If it's a question that we know we're gonna get to later on, we may not address it in the moment. Um, and of course, we'll take some questions at the end too. Um, so with that, I think we'll go ahead and get started. Um, as you can see here, we want to appeal to everybody, you know, people who have some eating disorder background, people who have some substance abuse background, hopefully, um, and those of you who don't have either, will get uh, something out of this. Um, so we of course have our conflict of interest statement. Um, nothing much to say there, uh, really. We, there is no conflict of interest. We have no affiliations or involvement, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you've all seen these before. I don't think we need to add anything there. But feel free to read that thoroughly if you'd like. Um, so our objectives today are to discuss the interplay and similarities and differences between eating disorders and substance use disorders, and then other um, uh, diagnoses that might occur in the adolescent population. Um, we're definitely gonna talk about a few treatment approaches with our emphasis being on the integrated treatment model. Um, we, there is a, a review of NIDA guidelines at the very end. Um, of the presentation um, that have been adapted for eating disorders for effective treatment um, that uh, we'll, we'll run through. Um, we're gonna uh, talk a bit about how to utilize a treatment team in, within treatment throughout all the levels of care and explain how to empower caregivers, right? Really to support our patients through motion-focused family therapy techniques. And I did wanna note that we do refer to our folks as patients. Um, you may call yours clients, um, but wanna make sure that we're just clear on that. Um, and um, I don't have much to say about the objectives. Anything you want to add, Jennifer? I, no, ba okay. basically it's kind of a wide variety of things that hopefully is helpful um, using different techniques to both identify when people need to go to higher levels of care, but also things to help support them like at the outpatient level as well. So hopefully you at least get a few takeaways. Yes, that's the hope. All right. So we'll start, Jennifer, I'll let you kind of take this screen um, in terms of some of the uh, eating disorder diagnoses that we see. Yeah, so I like to call this, so one thing you will notice is I tend to be a little bit casual in my approach and speaking as well. Um, and as we know, there's a DSM-5. If you are suspecting someone may have an eating disorder diagnosis, I highly recommend you refer to that in the exact criteria. And here's what I call um, the Cliff Notes version of eating disorder diagnoses, um, which I'm now learning. I thought I'd never be this person. I'm starting to date myself um, because, yeah, there wasn't, there was some web access. Anyways, so um, the first one is anorexia nervosa. 
Um, this tends to be the one when we say eating disorder that people tend to think of the most and in actuality of all the eating disorders tends to be diagnosed um, some of the least. Um, the anorexia nervosa is characterized by self-starvation, excessive weight loss, and has two cat diagnostic categories, restrictive anorexic and binge purge anorexic. And I wanna note that with any eating disorder, although yes, in the diagnosis for anorexia does mention weight loss, one big thing to start remembering, we're going to emphasize a couple times, is eating disorder. Eating disorders impact all body types, down to the anorexia and the restrictive piece. The large majority of the time, by looking at someone, regardless of their body type, it's hard to see if there's an eating disorder unless you really are attuned to like some of the changes with the skin and the hair or um, some of the you know binge purge things. So I think that's one thing to always keep in mind when talking to someone is. Do not judge it by what you know media has taught us an eating disorder is. Um, the next one is bulimia nervosa, which is characterized by cycling of binging and compensatory behaviors. And comp compensatory behaviors can be um, self-induced vomiting, laxative abuse, over exercising and what happens is after a binge happens they are pretty quickly going to one of these behaviors um, within like a short period of time after that um, and it definitely is a cycle this is a little different than thanksgiving next week where everyone does like the turkey trot in the morning and then goes and enjoys you know lovely meal um, with someone close to them oftentimes it's a little bit different than that this is happening pretty regularly um, binge eating disorder got put in the last dsm which was so exciting um, is characterized by recurrent binge eating without regular use of those compensatory behaviors that I mentioned with the bulimia to counter the binge eating. Um, and the binge eating does occur at least a few times per month, um, pretty ongoing and is like a large uncharacteristic amount of food. Um, and it can be a variety of types of food as well, typically, um, typically characterized by a few thousand calories um, per binge at least. Otherwise specified feeding or eating disorder, OSFED refers to abnormal eating or feeding without all the symptoms need to be diagnosed with one of the above, um, such as night eating syndrome is an example of that. And finally, avoidant restrictive food intake disorder, ARFID also got put in the last DSM. Um, and this is a lot of times gets you start noticing things pretty young, childhood and infancy. If you've ever had someone in your life that could only eat like a certain amount of foods or certain types of foods, and this varies per patient, but a lot of times we hear when they come in like they were a picky baby. They were always like that. Um, sometimes with ARFID, it can be struggled with texture of foods. So sometimes ARFID patients can get down to eating like 10 to 20 only types of foods, otherwise they cannot eat, so they struggle to get nutrients. Um, and honestly, a, not always, but a lot of times it can be things like a grilled cheese or chicken nuggets. There's only this one type of peanut butter and it really impairs their living um, quite a bit. It also can develop for those um, connections sometimes, of course, with trauma, but also if there's ever like a choking situation in their life, it can come with that. And once again, for a lot of people, sometimes texture can come into play with the ARFID. Um, I think that, especially since it's new to the DSM, is greatly under um, diagnosed. All right. So <clears throat> we wanted to get into a few um, statistics here. Um, some of these, uh, we use childmind.org as a great resource. Um, and just really understanding some of the most common psychiatric disorders in childhood. And of course, we've got a differentiation there with, uh, for those uh, who have severe impairment. And we're seeing anxiety disorders um, <clears throat> is, is pretty high up there. It doesn't surprise me. What I do want to note is that this um, particular graphic, I don't have anything more up to date. They don't have anything more up to date. Um, I feel certain that we would see some different percentages with uh, the advent of COVID um, and, you know, just by report and, and some of the research that we have on adult population, et cetera, we know that kids are reporting more um, in terms of, of anxiety and depression and that kind of thing. And, and Child Mind does have some of that, um, that they've been pulling uh, teens and kids and we are seeing reports of that. Um, but uh, they didn't have a neat infographic <laughs> uh, with some of that newer information. But this is typically what we're seeing. And um, you know, eating disorders is a, a, a pretty small percentage. And I will tell you, doing what I do for a living, I have an eight-year-old at home, and I am hypersensitive to, um, like she refused to eat her peanut butter and jelly sandwich today 
And, uh, you know, I don't let her know that, but inside I'm thinking, oh my gosh, this is an eating disorder. And I have to remind myself that though I'm surrounded by people who struggle with eating disorders, a, a fairly small percentage of the population really does struggle with it. Um, so I have to remind myself of that. Uh, and some of you might do the same thing when it comes to substances, I do the same thing or et cetera. But um, we're seeing here, uh, you know, about 30, almost 32% struggling with anxiety disorders. Um, and these are young people ages 13 to 18, about 20% for ADHD and disruptive behavior. I think way more than 20% report having ADHD, <clears throat> but in terms of an actual diagnosis, this is what we're looking at. And then um, uh, about 14% or so with depression and bipolar disorder. Um, so, you know, these are things, it, in, a, in a strange way, this makes me hopeful that we're collecting this data, which I know sounds strange. And the reason I say that is because it used to be that when a, a kid was expressing the symptoms of their, what we now know as diagnoses, we just wrote them off as being bad kids or not caring or coming from a bad environment. Um, et cetera, and, and just kind of washed our hands of those kids. And I'm feeling hopeful that we're starting to understand finally um, that we're looking at diagnoses and, and they may be subclinical threshold kind of uh, you know, uh, diag um, characteristics kind of coming out, but it's allowing us to approach these kids with more empathy and also being able to recognize they need treatment not to be written off as bad or um, somebody who just doesn't care. Um, so I know that that seems strange to be hopeful about this, but it's always been there. We're just finally identifying it for what it is, is the way I feel about it. Um, we also, I also got a, a bunch of great information off of my, my Nita.org, um, which is the National Eating Disorders Association. Um, and they've got some really, really great stuff and they have some really cool infographics, um, uh, a few of which I have here but really wanting folks to understand this, uh, the kind of co-occurrence between eating disorders and something like, the reason I specifically pulled out obsessive compulsive disorder is because we're starting to recognize that OCD has been widely underdiagnosed. And a lot of people have been, um, I mean, I hate to use this word, but egregiously misdiagnosed with something other than obsessive compulsive disorder when that's really what they're struggling with. And I've worked with a lot of people who've suffered and suffered for years and then finally got an obsessive compulsive disorder diagnosis and finally are experiencing some relief because one, they know what it is um, because so many of them feel like the diagnoses they've been given are not um, speaking to what they're experiencing and feel quote crazy um, and like they can't be helped. But um, so really understanding that we, we need to be on the lookout for that. Uh, but we're looking at about 70% um, of patients with anorexia nervosa are struggling with obsessive compulsive disorder and about 33% of those patients with bulimia nervosa um, are struggling with it. And for those of you who work with eating disorders, that may make a bit of sense to you. Um, if you know anything, and I know that there's a DBT approach um, with FRC, um, we talk a lot about over-controlled and under-controlled, and you know, it, it, we see a lot of folks who are more over-controlled presenting with the anorexia diagnoses, um, et cetera. So um, we see that these probably really play into each other. And then um, in terms of other co-occurring disorders, um, really taking a look at um, these respondents who have eating disorders and uh, meeting the criteria for um, one or more co-occurring disorders. So it doesn't specify which they might meet with, but a, a little more than half of those people with anorexia are struggling with co-occurring disorders. About 80% of people with binge eating disorder are struggling and 95 respondents with bulimia nervosa are struggling with co-occurring disorders. So, um, and, and about 64% of those folks uh, also fit the criteria for three or more disorders in addition to bulimia nervosa. So we have to pay attention to co-occurring. I think we probably are all aware of this at this point in time. And I can't imagine that any of this data is really all that surprising. All right, um, so in terms of teens, dieting and disordered eating is very common and I imagine we are not very surprised by that. Um, about 62% of uh, teens assigned female at birth are trying to lose weight. That's a big deal. 
Um, and about 60% are actively dieting and about 68% are exercising to lose weight. And so for those of you who may struggle, um, because we've been raised to believe that exercise is to lose weight and really understanding that our approach here is that exercise is not intended to lose weight. It, there are a whole bunch of other reasons that one might engage in exercise. Um, and, um, but when we have this intention behind it, um, it can get pretty compulsive in nature. And we see some lower numbers for those people assigned male at birth, um, but they are certainly still out there. Um, I'm also guessing that maybe some of the low numbers are, is just based on reporting, because I think there's still a lot of stigma around acknowledging that I might have an eating disorder if I'm assigned male at birth. Um, I think it's really important to talk about bullying and teasing and the prevalence of weight-based teasing. Um, girls in higher weight bodies, uh, about 40%, and then you know uh, boys in higher weight bodies, about so it's very similar, about 37% are being teased based on their weight. And this is something that I think we all agree has to stop. Now, we are not going to be able to make it stop completely and totally, but I think continued education, continued, um, you know, uh, getting people into the health at every size movement and body positivity or even body neutrality um, will be really helpful as, as um, these kids continue to grow. Um, and the best known environmental contributor to the development of an eating disorder is the socio-cultural idealization of thinness. And so media, 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 and then those of us, um, you know, that buy into it and, and continue to sometimes with no ill intention whatsoever, um, continue to perpetuate this idea. And so by the age of six, um, people assigned female at birth uh, start to express concerns about their own weight or shape. Six years old. For those of you who have kids or nieces or nephews or work with kids, those are babies, right? And it's a little bit scary. Um, about 40 to 60% of elementary school girls age six to 12 are concerned about their weight or about becoming fat. These kind of statistics make me very, very sad. Um, and then uh, when we talk about um, elementary school girls um, uh, in America, those who read magazines, about 70% say that the pictures influence the concept of the ideal body shape. Now I'm feeling hopeful because we're starting to see wider representation of you know, body shape in addition to you know, height and color of skin and you know, people uh, with different types of skin you know, um, and, and seeing in, in people with uh, you know, uh, amputated legs. And so we're starting to see greater uh, representation, I think, and that's gonna be helpful. And hopefully over time, we'll see this number de decrease, um, but this is what we're looking at right now. And then about almost half of them say that the pictures make them want to lose weight. So it's pretty scary. I find it pretty scary. Um, and, and again, hoping that this push towards being more inclusive of what we see represented in the real world around us um, will help with some of these. Okay, I'm not gonna spend too much more time on this, but really um, I do think it's important to note that um, the, it, um, eating disorders, mood and anxiety, those kinds of things are really, really underdiagnosed in people um, in different populations, um, especially those uh, people of color. And so when we take a look at identical case studies um, demonstrating disordered eating symptoms in white, Hispanic, and Black women, people assigned female at birth, um, clinicians were asked to identify if the woman's eating behavior was problematic. 44% identify the white woman's eating uh, behavior as problematic. 41 identified the Hispanic woman's eating behavior as problematic, and only 17 identified the Black woman's eating behavior as problematic. We know that that number is not accurate, that it's not, you know, there aren't less people who are Black that are displaying eating disorder um, issues. Um, so this is definitely an unconscious bias um, that we're seeing um, played out. And so we have to bring awareness um, uh, of this uh, to ourselves as clinicians to better serve um, the folks that we work with. Okay, Jennifer, I'll turn this over to you. We're going to talk a bit about some of these um, behaviors that may yeah. be. And with that, it gets into behaviors. And there's a couple slides on this and a few things, especially with adolescence, um, it can be tricky. And it can be tricky to identify an eating disorder, especially if it's not something you go through each day. But I think a biggest thing to, for both yourselves and if you're working with parents who are concerned is 
having awareness of especially when patterns change within an individual or a teenager, um, having awareness that if there were foods or habits that a year ago they were doing that seemed to cause avoidance or distress now, that's kind of a sign. Um, one thing I, this is a really unofficial just observation, but like one example is teenagers in the summer often will sleep till 10, 11, 12, one, wake up, have a bowl of cereal, eat dinner with their parents, right? And that sounds really restrictive, but what do they often then do, especially like early, later adolescents with more independence, right? They go out with their friends and they go to McDonald's or they go to, I'm from Wisconsin, they go to, we go to Country Kitchen and have fries or order a pizza and that wouldn't, they'd be able to do that without a lot of distress, um, even with some of those, um, pieces that like Leah mentioned with like our society and dieting, even with those in mind, they're able to pretty regularly do that without distress. Um, and that is like one of the big things that like I encourage people to look for is like, is there a sudden change compared to a year or two ago, or even just sometimes they can even slowly morph. Um, and especially with adolescence, it's easier to hide things. So if you're suspecting something, I encourage um, in addition to a therapist very directly asking questions, but also encourage parents to maybe try to like do some of those things and foods they would eat, you know, a year or two before and kind of see how it works. Um, some of the behaviors um, that included in this and behaviors, my piece is uh, an eating disorder can, behavior really can be a large majority of things done too little or too much of the time. There are hundreds and hundreds of eating disorder behaviors. I literally had someone that I initially thought was a joyful adolescent in programming a number of years ago, and she would kind of sing and dance during the meals. And then I realized within a few days, I'm like, dancing during meals is your eating disorder behavior. I also realized she was kind of flinging like little lipids leftover food off her fork, which I was pretty sure wasn't intentional. So that's an example of something you might think is joyful, like, in her case, it was a way to burn calories. Um, some listed on here, you may have already been reading it as I've been mumbling on, is um, especially leaving table within 10 minutes after eating a meal. Once again, especially if that wasn't something that was you know, happening a year or two earlier, stirring or playing with food rather than eating. So the perception of eating food, moving around, but really not much content is going into the mouth. Skipping meals consistently, Skipping a meal, then overeating another meal is an eating disorder behavior. One thing, especially with binge eating disorder, is quite a few people with binge eating disorder, um, they restrict during the day and sometimes intentional, sometimes they really aren't hungry. And they tend to do a lot of their overeating in the evening, especially when they're alone um, due to that shame factor. And especially if they have a binge, a lot of times they're naturally not hungry the next day, but also they tend to go in that diet mentality of like, I'm going to be good, I'm going to stop this, I'm going to break this habit as well. Um, consistently tired or fatigued, especially the longer the behaviors happen, the body's not getting the nutrients it needs. Consistently setting and communicating goals around getting physically healthy. Um, especially in our society, it is very typical to start with, there's always some trend, right? The 90s, it was fat free. And then we had, um, what was it, Atkins in the 2000s. And now it's like keto, dairy free. And yes, yeah, some people definitely in working with their doctors, like those are things they need to do. But they're starting with a trend of I am going to be gluten dairy free, even though there is not medical indicators for that. And then it goes to, well, I'm going to take out sugars. And then it goes to, I'm going to take out meat. And then next thing you know, there's such a limited set amount that is not due to medical reason. Um, and there's a lot of resistance when trying to incorporate other foods back around that. Um, exercising, despite getting physical injuries, we see this a lot with eating disorder in high school athletes, is like they'll run, 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 and stress fracture after stress fracture. And ooh, that's a fun one to say, stress fracture say that five times fast. Um, and they're still exercising even though they need to rest and the coaches are calling for it. Um, I give a lot of coaches, I've worked quite a bit in um, the Northern suburbs and I've actually noticed a lot of the high school coaches do a pretty good job actually at identifying um, eating disorders and these patterns through the physical injuries. I've had it happen multiple times, which I think is amazing um, step of progress. Um, exercising again, um, talk a little bit about that. A lot of things, this is where foods as good or bad and really extremes. This is another society thing. And by the way, if you do any of these things, like 
okay, no shame, right? This is once again, society. I, I suspect you all haven't been like reading, researching eating disorders for many years and gotten a little bit more trained out of you. Um, but especially foods as good or bad, especially when it starts getting to like fruits and vegetables and grains, like it's just kind of everything turns into good or bad. Um, we really teach eating all foods in moderation and talking about nourishing your body with a variety of foods. Um, versus labeling as good or bad. Expressing concerns about being fat, gaining weight, um, and treatment in an ordinate conversation about food, body, calorie intake. Maybe that's all they talk about all the time of obsessing. Really rigid eating, which I referenced a little bit in the beginning of a lot of distress. Even it comes down to, for some people, even times. Dinner's off by a few minutes, 15 minutes, and there's a high level of distress around that. I have to tell you, every time I do a presentation, which isn't very often from home, there's a large truck in my neighborhood. So I apologize if anyone else can hear that. Leah, you can go to the next slide. Oh, you already did. Um, additional behaviors outside of eating. So with adolescents, and I say like really any like mental health concerns, um, it was once taught to me to look at it in like three rough categories, right? There's adolescence life are very family involved, friend involved and school involved. I think if it has a Venn diagram, did you all get that from this? Um, and when one or more of those really go downhill, that's a sign there's something going on within the adolescent, especially the friend piece, because that is pretty crucial. So socially withdrawing, increased anxiety, mood swings that seem atypical for a teenager, especially around food, things like that, or asking why they're withdrawing. Um, and just kind of feeling out what that difference might be. Um, difficulties concentrating may or may not have weight fluctuations. This is one trick that you know a lot of people are shocked by. Need education is like my 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 kiddo's okay. Like they're normal weight. They're eating really good. They're exercising. Like they're fine. It's not an eating disorder. And that's where we go back to that anxiety base around meals. And also, it's okay to acknowledge like that is normal for our society. We're not going to shame that. And you know, you list X, Y, Z things or kind of what's going on that you want that further assessment. Um, calluses or sores on the back of the hand can be indicated of purging. Um, purging, it might be on another slide. Also, um, there tends to be a lot of sudden cavities where the front teeth start moving a little bit as well. Most dentists will observe it um, pretty quickly the, and they can usually tell the difference between like regular acid reflux versus purging. Um, dizziness, cold, sleep issues, there's the dental problems. Um, sometimes they hoard food as well. Um, excess gum chewing, excess use of caffeine or sparkling water. Okay, so as someone who sometimes might drink a lot of sparkling water and caffeine, um, this is once again, it's down to they're using it to restrict their appetite. And it is like many, many cans or many, many cups of coffee or whatever use of caffeine per day to restrict appetite. And when that is de like decreased or eliminated, once again, that stress anxiety. Do you have anything to add, Leah? All right. I do not. Um, so studies suggest that it's important for us to really consider and screen for these sub-threshold levels, right, of eating disorders. And, and I would argue also for substance use, um, because the idea is we want to catch it early on. The earlier on we catch it, um, the more likely we are to see success in really getting somebody um, into a place of recovery, um, et cetera. So, um, this is where you don't have to be an expert in substance use or in eating disorders um, to uh, have some awareness of and recognize some of the potential characteristics or symptoms so that you can then refer them to somebody who is an expert who can then make the call from there about what, if anything, needs to be addressed or done. Um, so this is prevention, 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 right? And then intervention as early on as possible. Um, so one of the screening tools that could be helpful um, to screen for a potential eating disorder is the SCOF questionnaire. Um, and so you just, you know, you ask some of these questions. Um, do you make yourself sick because you feel uncomfortably full? Do you worry that you've lost control over how much you eat? Um, have you really recently lost more than one stone? Obviously, this was not created in the States um, in a three-month period. Uh, do you believe yourself to be fat when others say you're too thin? Um, would you say that food dominates your life? Now, just because someone answers yes to some of these does not necessarily mean that there is an eating disorder there, but it does tell us that we need to explore further to make sure. And this is very similar to, for those of you who are familiar with the CAGE questionnaire, um, 
uh, really, uh, it's, it's the same idea, right? Um, and so, you know, Cage is, uh, have you ever tried to cut down on your use? Have people annoyed you by, you know, criticizing or, you know, mentioning your use? Um, have you ever felt guilty? And then have you ever had an eye opener? Um, which is using first thing in the morning. And the cage is really directed towards alcohol, but really you can shift the language to, to substances, period. Um, and it still works out. Um, so the cage and the scoff are, are quick ways of just like, hey, we need to know more. Um, so that's a tool that might be helpful for some of you. Okay, so really taking a look at the age of onset of types of disorders in children. Um, so we're looking at um, age six is the median age of onset for anxiety, age 11 for ADHD and behavior disorders, age 13 for mood disorders, and age 15 for substance use. Um, that's the median age, right? That means that there are kids who are younger who are already engaging in substance use. Um, and, and in a, well, it's problematic regardless because of the age, but um, really uh, we need to pay attention to these, to these kiddos and, um, and screen for some of these things. I, I know that sometimes, you know, there used to be a point and there are probably still some folks out there who are like, oh, they're too young to, you know, have this or to have that. And, and that is not the case. And so really needing to be aware of that. Um, we do have some chats that I realized we haven't, um, <laughs> Uh, There's just your, one that popped up, um, yep. which is from uh, Cage Dash Aid is for substance yeah. other than alcohol. Okay. All right. So I'm guessing that there are three. I'm not aware of this one. Um, I'm guessing that there are three additional questions for the A, the I, and the D. Um, and so I will be googling that later. Um, and then our, just uh, for, the, for those of you needing our first and last name, of course, we'll have that printed up again on the last screen, I think, of the presentation. But um, Jennifer McAdams and Leah Young, opposite of old. All right, why am I not advancing now? Hold on, oh, there we go. Okay, so I wanna talk a little bit about um, substance abuse and mental health disorders in kids. Um, so uh, kids with anxiety disorders may use substances, including alcohol, right? Um, and, uh, oh, I should have changed this language. I don't use the term marijuana anymore, gang. Um, for those of you who aren't aware, marijuana is, um, it has a lot of social implications. It was a term that was utilized to vilify people with brown skin um, way back when. And I don't make my patients correct themselves if they want to refer to it as marijuana, but um, we do utilize the term cannabis here. Um, it's more clinically accurate in any case. Um, so I apologize for that. I will call it a typo. Um, but kids with anxiety disorders um, it use substances, including alcohol and cannabis to calm down before, so just like adults do, right? Before social events, including going to school. And so we have a lot of kids who have a ton of anxiety around school and it could be wrapped up around bullying. It could be that they, they don't like school, that they're not, they don't excel at school. It could be a number of different things. And so a lot are using before school and during the school day, um, filling water bottles with things like vodka. Um, and so nobody knows uh, that they're drinking throughout the day. Kids who are depressed can also obviously use substances to cheer themselves up and, and then blunt that irritability that's associated with teen depression. Um, you know, make themselves feel a little more happy-go-lucky, a little bit like they care a little less, um, et cetera. Uh, kids struggling with mental health and learning disorders in particular um, struggle with self-esteem and they have this sense um, that there's something wrong with them or that they're flawed and they just want to fit in. Um, and uh, using substances with their friends is one way to do that, obviously. So there really is something about peer pressure. Um, and even if their peers aren't pressuring, just wanting to feel like they're part of and don't feel so different um, from others uh, is, is a huge reason that kids use substances. And I mean, think about it. I'm addressing this in terms of kids, but this could all be true about adults too. Um, so I think a lot of it is just very much the human condition and what substances do do for us. So all these kids and kids who are using substances are at risk for developing addiction because their brains are still learning. And then what happens because their brains are, are like in learning mode, we're still developing neural pathways. The brain is still developing. They can learn it much more quickly. They learn addiction much more quickly than an adult who somebody who starts using as an adult. Um, and then substances work temporarily to alleviate all the above but ultimately leads to the kid, kiddos feeling worse when they're not using. Um, and uh, so, you know, they seek it out more frequently, more often. And then, of course, um, substances do affect the same areas of the brain that some mental health uh, disorders operate in. Um, I'm going to check the chat. Uh, looks like, okay, 
we've got uh, a website link there. Okay, thank you. So really there's almost like a hyper learning that happens for kids. Um, and so they, you know, the earlier we start using, the more likely we are to develop addiction um, because of the way the brain continues to develop. All right, so let's get into, I don't know why my, hold on, there's my cursor, there we go. These are the statistics slides, right? Okay, so we wanna think about some of these substance statistics here with kiddos. Um, and so amongst youth ages 12 to 20, according to this 2009, um, the National Survey on uh, Drug Use and Health, about 27.2%, and I shouldn't say about, 27.2 is a very specific number, reported drinking alcohol in the past month. And of those, 18.1% reported binge drinking. So binge drinking um, for people assigned female at birth is um, three or more drinks um, in, I'm sorry, yes, um, three or more drinks, I believe in, um, let's go with four drinks, I think is the average, in a couple of hours time, because the liver can process one drink per hour, and so if I'm drinking two drinks per hour, I'm really taxing the liver, and that is considered a binge, and I know a lot of the folks that I work with are surprised at that, because they think of a binge as like having a lot, eight, 12, 24 drinks, and not realizing that it can actually be a small number um, in, in a fairly short period of time. Um, and for people assigned male at birth, the number is not that much different, quite honestly. So that's what we're looking at in terms of binge drinking. And a lot of folks will deny that their use is problematic because um, they only binge drink every once in a while. And they're not doing it regularly and they're not drinking normally reg normally regularly. So they don't consider the every once in a while binge problematic in nature. Um, amongst 8th, 10th, and 12th graders in 2011, 27.8% had tried cigarettes in their lifetime and about 11.7% reported that they had smoked within the past month. So, um, you know, cigarettes and vapes, uh, vaping nicotine are a big deal um, amongst our, our students and, and kiddos. And one of the things I think that contributes particularly to vaping is this idea that it's safer than smoking cigarettes. And it is not. It's just different. Um, and so uh, one of the issues I'll just kind of note that's coming with vaping is that we're seeing a lot of kids vaping cannabis. Again, for some of the same reasons, they feel like it's safer to vape it than it is to smoke like a joint, for example. And not recognizing that one, the THC concentrations in those cannabis cartridges tend to be extraordinarily high, way more than the brain is intended to manage at any one given time. Um, but also that, you know, the people are making these cartridges with a bunch of stuff in it that we don't even know what half of it is. Um, and then we have things like vitamin E, S, vitamin E acetate. Nope, that's not what it's called. That is what it's called. Um, and it's, it's a thickener, um, basically, and, and that's going in our lungs. Um, I feel like vitamin E acetate is not correct. My brain is blanking. I will try to remember it before the uh, uh, presentation is over. Um, the degree to which teens disapprove of marijuana uh, cannabis use and the perceived risk associated with it has begun to decline. Um, and so there was this period of time um, in the late 90s, early 2000s, where this idea that cannabis was um, uh, not okay started to increase, right? People started to be like, no, yeah, I'm not going to use that. And that's starting to decline again. So it's taking a turn where it's um, and one of the key phrases that I often hear our patients say is it's just weed um, and recognizing that it's not just weed. Um, so um, that's begun to decline. And I think some of that does come from parents who are like, oh, I used to smoke when I was a kid, not recognizing that the THC content in your average joint has gone up from about 5% um, to about 15% now. This is your average joint. Of course, we can see much higher concentrations. Hey, Leah, it is vitamin D or vitamin E. Nina it made is. a comment regarding it. And thank you for sending that survey, yeah. Nina. Yes. Thank you so much for, uh, for fact checking me. I don't know why it just didn't sound right to me um, this morning for some reason. Um, Painkillers are one of the most commonly used drugs by teens, um, kind of coming into place after uh, tobacco, alcohol, and cannabis. Um, and so, you know, another thing that we're seeing a lot is um, kids having pill parties uh, where they just bring whatever's in the medicine cabinet at home and dump them in a bowl and, you know, just take whatever. Um, so we really do need to pay attention to these things. Um, oh, gosh, did I? Yep. 
and and uh, that's it for the substance abuse statistics uh, for the moment. But we need to pay attention, and and kids are pretty sneaky, as we know, and they're really good at kind of hiding things from us. And I think that we also have a tendency, especially when they're our kids, right, or kids that you know that we care about and we're involved in their lives, is we kind of put the blinders on. Sometimes we don't want to imagine that they might be doing this. Um, you know, we feel like we've raised them with refusal skills and things like that. But as Jennifer mentioned, friends become ultra important, more important, in fact, than family and anything else for a period of time in their lives. And so um, sometimes the stuff that we've taught them gets shoved to the back for a while um, and, uh, you know, doesn't uh, pop up until later on in life. But um, we, we need to be having these discussions and having this awareness uh, with them and not letting our own potential biases come into play. So our own ideas around alcohol and cannabis and, and nicotine and what might be acceptable, we have to set those aside when we're working with the kiddos, um, for sure. And I would argue with all patients, but um, that's something I would note. All right, Jennifer, I'll turn this over to you. Hello, so um, things to ask and what to try to avoid saying. Um, the, don't, the don'ts is actually where I'm going to start with this is um, especially comments on like one's physical appearance, once again, have natural in society and someone especially struggling with an eating disorder, um, even with the best of intentions can be very triggering and upsetting for them. Um, Cause even when someone is in treatment and recovery and it's like, yes, I want recovery. That eating disorder mind is still pretty large and it's gonna go through and kind of fight them at any chance. So things not to ask someone that you suspect or know has an eating disorder, including you don't look like you have an eating disorder. I may have mentioned once or twice, eating disorder impacts all body types and often you cannot tell from the outside. You could stand to lose some weight, I could stand to lose some weight myself. I've also seen people go like, I wish I could be anorexic. Not helpful. Um, and this is, this is a, these are funny ones, right? You look good. You look healthy, right? Cause I'm not saying, you know, to Leah, you know, like, oh, you've lost weight or anything specific, but for someone who's struggling with an eating disorder, once again, in that brain mindset, that eating disorder is going to push back of like, oh, you've been eating too much or you have not acted on these other behaviors too much. And it's going to create some challenge. Um, another piece is just eat healthier foods and you'll be okay. Um, you don't look fat. You're too skinny. Um, anything once again with sizing is typically not helpful. Oh, you got a little too ambitious over there. Um, we like to focus on things like inside the person, like how are they feeling, like the mind, the brain, things like that. Do you ask what do you, especially if you're assessing for an eating disorder, what do you think about your body? You know, what are diets? What are things you have tried? Are there some ways you've tried to lose weight? You know, do you have worries about eating and how your body affects your daily life or how your body affects your daily life, right? Because if they're in school saying like, I feel like because I'm in a larger body, like I cannot try out for dance team, or I feel like I'm getting judged or I'm not going to get asked to a dance. Um, that is kind of a sign there might be something that's going on. How often do you make up for or spend calories off after eating in order to keep from gaining weight? How often do you feel out of control when eating, right? That's an emotional eating piece um, and calculating that, right? Some humans have their times, once again, in our culture that I had a rough day or I had a good day and I'm gonna, you know, eat or treat myself to reward but how often is that happening? And how often is that mindset also occurring? And how often do you eat for reasons, once again, other than being physically hungry? Can you even tell the difference between the emotional hunger and physical hunger? A lot of us aren't, especially if the more busy you are and think of a teenager, aren't that in tune with their body and what cues it is sending us. And we're getting a little bit better with mindfulness as a culture, but we still have a lot of long ways to go. One of the things I want to note is if you're sitting here looking at the don't list thinking, well, what do you say to somebody then is I just learned to say, it's good to see you. It's simple as that. It, it, and it's just letting somebody know that I'm glad to be in your presence and just not commenting. I mean, we even get to the point where if you say to somebody uh, something along the lines of, oh, I really like your shirt. Somebody with an eating disorder is like, they were looking at my body. The shirt's too tight. And so, I mean, it's not about having to walk around on eggshells around everybody all the time. It's about just being a little bit more thoughtful. And um, I think in particular in treatment, right? Um, you know, we, 
we should be allowed to comment on people's new shirt that we really like. Um, and within the treatment setting, let's really try to keep it to, it's good to see you. Um, I'm glad you're here. Um, I missed you, those kinds of things. All right. Okay, so um, a few things that we wanna uh, kind of note uh, are the similarities. There are a lot of similarities between eating disorders and substance use disorders, and both of them do typically begin in adolescence um, or early adulthood. And of course, they have to include these behaviors that function to maintain the disorder. Um, otherwise, you know, we wouldn't be allowed to get away with it, if you will, right? Um, so continuing to engage despite harmful consequences. And we have to be careful about consequences, right? Because a lot of times people are just looking for the big ones. Well, that hasn't happened to me yet, or I've never done that. And we really want to pay attention to some of the smaller ones or some of the internal consequences. Um, so for example, uh, in order to continue engaging in my eating disorder or my substance use disorder, I may have to be dishonest with people that I love and care about. And maybe I value honesty. And so that would be an internal consequence because I'm going against my value system, which is going to result in feelings of shame and remorse and guilt, which of course is going to contribute to um, eating disorder behaviors and substance use. Um, both have a high tendency towards um, recurrence of use um, or, or in recurrence uh, or re-engagement in use. Um, and so really understanding that. Um, and then uh, they alter the way we relate to other people. Uh, both have high mortality rates. They're both life-threatening disorders. Um, for sure, um, in our long-term illnesses as well. So recognizing that because we go through treatment, we're not cured. We do have to remember to be vigilant throughout our lives. It doesn't mean that we have to go at it with the same gusto that we did in early treatment as we establish recovery and maintain it. Um, but it, we don't just one day say, oh, well, you know what, maybe I overreacted. I didn't really have an eating disorder and I can, um, sometimes we do wake up one day and say that, but that's not how these um, uh, illnesses work. Both are seen in terms of morality. And so these questions, well, why don't you just eat? Just eat a hamburger. Oh my gosh, I've heard that one before. Or why don't they just stop using? You can just have one, right? When we ask someone a question like that, or when someone asks one of our patients or clients a question like that, the, the impl implication is, well, you must not care enough or else you would just eat. You must not love me enough. You must not have enough passion for your career. You must be weak-willed because I can just eat, right? And so these are moral questions and the person asking them may just be trying to understand their intentions may be good, but the impact is one of judgment, which increases shame. Um, of course, uh, both operate in denial, secrecy, and shame. They, they cannot exist in the light of day. Um, they can fight to exist, but once they're exposed, you know, we start working on them. And then uh, we see obviously the comorbidity as, as was discussed. Some additional similarities, we see uh, a lot of behavioral symptoms that are the same where we have a difficult time managing tension, um, uh, stress, et cetera. Um, we see a lot of impulsivity and compulsivity. Um, I often um, describe compuls compulsion as like a moth being drawn to a flame or we might even be engaging in the behavior thinking, I don't wanna do this. Why am I doing this? Leah, stop doing this. And I'm continuing to do the thing. That's a compulsion. And then this preoccupation, I'm thinking about it constantly. I'm planning ahead. I'm thinking about when I'm going to be able to pick up again, or what is this party going to be like? Is there going to be a bunch of food there? Is anyone going to notice that I'm not eating? Um, and we're thinking about it all the time. And then neurobiology is, is very, very similar. Of course, there are some differences, but really that limbic system and the reward pathway um, are, are both involved. And so just really kind of briefly talking about the limbic system, um, it's involved in survival. And so um, what happens when we use a substance um, with frequency and regularity and the same thing with engaging in eating disordered behaviors is, or, and other compulsive behaviors, quite honestly, like sex or spending or whatever, uh, potentially compulsive behaviors, I should say. Um, what happens is our survival mechanism uh, gets tricked into thinking that the number one thing we need for survival is the substance or the eating disorder behavior. And if we don't engage in it, we are not going to draw our next breath. And so this is why you can have someone promising to you from the bottom of their heart that they are never going to use again. And they mean it in that moment. And then their survival center kicks in and says, you're going to die if you don't have another drink. You better go drink right now and find themselves even within 10 minutes a day later um, drinking or engaging in their behaviors. And so the good news is that we can disconnect. Um, we can uh, make this association uh, null and void 
with some time. Um, and it usually means time away from and not having access to our eating disorder behaviors or our substances until our brain kind of finally figures out like, wait a second, I'm still breathing. Maybe I don't actually need that thing for survival. The other piece that I liked, and I educate our patients on that, and it reduces a lot of shame. It doesn't absolve them of the responsibility for the consequences of their use or their engagement, um, but it allows them to recognize, oh, I actually do love my family. It's not because I don't. Um, and then the reward path, I also um, help them kind of understand this a bit, of course, involved in learning, um, very much involved in learning, but um, also, uh, our cravings and urges. Uh, so when we experience something pleasurable, dopamine is released and dopamine says, oh, I really liked that thing. And glutamate says, cool, I'll remember. So glutamate is another neurochemical and one of its duties is to help with memory formation. And then when we're feeling distressed or dysregulated, lonely, bored, angry, whatever it might be, um, we, you know, dopamine says, you know that thing I really like, I want it right now. And glutamate says, go get it. And so that's a craving or an urge. And that's something that that is supposed to happen in our brains, but it sometimes gets attached to something that actually isn't any good for our survival, like drugs. And so we find ourselves um, experiencing those. And um, oftentimes patients learning about this neurochemical cascade happening in our brain helps them to be able to almost diffuse from it and say, oh, this is just my brain doing that thing. I don't have to give into that craving. I can pick up the phone and call somebody. I can distract myself. I can, um, you know, engage in some self-care instead. I can go to a meeting, whatever it might be. I'm gonna. Um, we do have uh, good references for the biological similarities between eating disorders and substance use disorder diagnoses. That is an excellent um, question. Offer good references for the biological similarities. Yeah. Um, let's see. I don't know that I can ch uh, chat them off the top of my head, um, but uh, yeah. Let's make sure we can come up with something, Jennifer. Um, so uh, both disorders involve uh, disruption in, in appetite and satiation. Um, we see some obsessive kind of compulsive behaviors, not necessarily the full-blown diagnosis, but we see that as well. Certainly some self-destructive behaviors and sometimes they don't care. Um, so saying to somebody who has an eating disorder, you know, if you keep doing this, you're gonna die. It, we feel like that would jar them, but sometimes they're like, mm, and? So we have to be really cautious about that approach. And um, for some people, it does shake them up, um, but for others, it's kind of where they're heading and intentionally so. So we need to know our folks when we say those kinds of things to them. And then uh, that says sever medical consequences, but it should be severe medical consequences um, as well. Uh, one of the things to answer that question about um, references and resources. Um, so there's a movie that I pull a lot of information from and, and use some of it here called Pleasure Unwoven. And it's um, Dr. Kevin McCauley, and I imagine some of you are very familiar with it. Um, but he has this, this um, visual representation called the periodic table of the entire Toxicants that he kind of came up with. It looks like the periodic table of elements. And the idea is to kind of illustrate um, one of the dopamine, there are dopamine hypotheses out there, right? And so the idea is that if I struggle with any one substance or behavior, which includes eating disorders, um, I am automatically at risk for struggling with any and all of the others. Um, and so that, and there's he goes through the entire neuroscience, the different areas of the brain, and he addresses it from a substance point of view, but you can really approach it from an eating disorder point of view as well, really understanding the reward pathways, memory, stress, um, and genetics, et cetera. Um, so that might be one good place to start, but I'm, I know we can probably come up with others. Okay, here we go. So some more similarities, because they never end, um, is we see this progression with both substance use disorders and eating disorders where there's a loss of control, which uh, my definition is we start behaving in ways that don't line up with who we are. Sometimes we're even sitting there thinking, who is that? I don't even know who that person is. Um, it goes against, we go against our values. Um, both can be resistant to treatment. Um, I think that there's a lot of um, societal stamps of approval on disordered eating as well as substance use. And so I think that that contributes to the denial that this is actually a problem because all my friends do the same thing. Um, continuing to engage despite negative consequences. They're both progressive in nature where we need increased amounts of the substance or the behavior to achieve the same results. And we see frequent recurrence um, of use or engagement. We've got similar risk factors. So the family history, um, which includes the family environment. You know, Jennifer was talking about those families where we, you know, we may be, um, 
impose upon our, our kids, um, you know, we're not going to eat a lot of carbs or you, you know, you have to eat everything in a particular order um, because you're not allowed to have the carbs until very last. You have to have your vegetables and your fruits and your proteins and then your carbs. So these kinds of things, um, the, the environment that we grow up in and the same thing with substances, what's approved, what's normalized and what isn't um, comes into play as well as genetics. And we don't all know our genetics, but if we do, that can be helpful. History of trauma, we are understanding at this point, finally, that it underlies so much and then lack of social supports, right? Um, so really not having those people in our lives who are going to provide us the kind of support that we need. Um, I'll really quickly take a peek at the, how do you address a patient struggling with binge eating who might say they are addicted to food? Ooh, that's a good one. Jennifer? The addiction to food, hold on, that one's not coming through for me. What was the question? Oh, you muted yourself already. Oh, wait, I just found it. Sorry. There's like two different comment boxes. So sometimes it takes me a second. How do you dress a patient struggling with binge eating who might say that they're addicted to food? Um, with that piece, like, you know, to my acknowledgement, like there is not an exact like direct tie to that. I know in the brain piece, and this is not with binge eating my specialty, um, but there is like certain areas that do light up. I know with sugar in that connection. Um, one thing is with addiction, with chemical dependency, you can cut that out. With food, you cannot, and there needs to be exposure throughout the life. So usually what we do is work with them on psychoeducation and also doing a lot of exposures. Um, what we typically find is people who naturally try to go like, okay, I cannot eat just one cookie. So I am not going to eat cookies anymore. I'm not going to eat sugar anymore. Guess what happens? They eventually encounter that in a situation and then it goes to extreme, which reinforces their thinking where if they work with dietitians and professionals on the ultimate goal is like not putting any judgments or restrictions on it because it naturally levels out um, with time, but there's a lot of vulnerability and willingness to do that. But working with exposures on how to eat something in moderation is how we approach it in the programming. I yeah, that helps. Yeah, I think that's really helpful, Jennifer. I, you know, the other thing is it's tough to move those folks away from this idea that food is an addiction and really help them understand our stance that, you know, addiction is, you know, thought of as being treated by abstinence, you know, that's the go-to. And, and so, yeah, really working with those exposures. Um, I think we don't tend to get into a tug of war if they insist on calling it addiction and we continue to teach what we teach anyway, which is learning how to be able to have a cookie or three, you know, um, without it becoming, you know, 12, 15, you know, 20 cookies. And even if it does, how do we get ourselves back to doing what we need to do um, to be safe and, and within our recovery? Um, so really um, it, is, it is challenging because uh, sugar in particular, I think is presented as an addiction a lot of times and there's arguments back and forth about it. And we just, we don't approach it that way because we're trying to change the mindset because like deprivation, that's what it is. When you deprive yourself of this thing, we're likely to binge. And I know I, we, it's weird because with substances, you know, aside from harm reduction, we're looking at abstinence, which is deprivation, but food is something we do need. Substances are not. Um, so that's a really, really great question. All right. So some of the differences, and this kind of comes up, right, is that substances have tolerance where we need more of the substance in order to achieve the same effect. They have a physical dependence and they have a withdrawal that is not applicable to eating disorders except we do see, you know, with our eating disorder folks, if they started at age 10 or 12 and they're now 26 years old, what used to work for them in terms of eating disorder behaviors no longer would work for them at age 26. So um, we, it would be more of a psychological kind of tolerance. And, and we also have to think about like what kind of neurochemicals are getting released when they engage in their eating disorder. So I kind of like the tolerance one is a little iffy, um, but really um, understanding that that is technically one of the differences. And that, like we mentioned, the goal for substance abuse treatment is abstinence, while the goal for eating disorders is to normalize eating behaviors um, versus abstinence from food. Um, several adolescents have been demonstrating ED behaviors that appear to be more related to borderline personality disorder traits. I'm gonna get to it later. Okay, let's do that. All right, excellent. So let's move ahead. Um, so uh, basically we wanna take a look at, um, 
the types of treatments, right, um, that uh, are available out there. And these are some our current treatment approaches. And the first we have a sequential treatment, which is where we focus on one disorder at a time. And we get the most acute one first. And we have found that um, this is potentially very problematic. So find somebody who struggles with anorexia um, and substance use, and I go to an eating disorder facility, a lot of times what happens is they're told, well, you got to get your substance use under control first before you can come to us. And then they go to the substance use facility and they're told, well, you got to get your eating disorder under control first before you come to us. Where are those patients left? They fall through the cracks and they're left feeling hopeless and like they cannot be helped. So um, the sequential treatment is not the most effective and it does sometimes still need to happen, right? So we have to get medical things addressed first. Sometimes we need to have somebody um, get a medical detoxification from their substance use, and then they spend some time in substance use treatment before coming to, you know, to eating disorder treatment. So we do need to occasionally make use of that, but it is not the ideal and not shouldn't be the go-to if possible. Now, parallel treatment is when both disorders or all disorders are addressed at the same time, but we have different providers and typically at different locations. And this can lead us open to splitting, um, to wires being crossed, to um, people inadvertently stepping on each other's toes, um, et cetera. And it makes it really hard. And there's like a lag in time a lot of, a lot of times trying to get each other on the phone. Um, so it can make it challenging. And I know that you know sometimes in some regions of the United States or elsewhere, we don't have access to anything other than parallel uh, treatment. So um, it's, it's good, yeah, it's great. But um, really we're moving towards evidence-based integrated treatment um, and it's, we're gaining more and more evidence for it, which is great news. Um, so, but really we wanna do integrated treatment. Um, and so the approach is we do this comprehensive screening for eating disorders, substance abuse, um, for behavioral um, compulsions and then co-occurring psychiatric disorders. We run medical uh, tests, uh, we run lab tests and we check for medical conditions and we get proof of medical conditions uh, when, when they come in the door, et cetera. We uh, utilize comprehensive drug screening um, and testing sometimes randomly throughout their state, it kind of depends. Um, and they're just really understanding how medical complications um, with these disorders are crucial. We have to pay attention to them, um, et cetera. And then really individualizing the treatment plan and making sure that it encompasses co-occurring psychiatric disorders, even if it's just keeping an eye on something that's going on because maybe it's not our area of expertise and um, it really is something that does need to be addressed later. So it is a more sequential thing, still including that, that this is a thing that we're paying attention to. All right, Jennifer, I'll let you talk about the treatment team a little bit. I really like Venn diagrams. I just have to say that, which one of my friends is who is a fifth grade teacher told me that's out and no longer a thing. It tried teaching me something different and I just was like, no. I did not accept it. Um, all right, so I will definitely get into, um, when I start getting the family therapy for some reason, um, Leah or those here, I forget to mention that personality, I call it personality flare piece, um, let me know, because I'm gonna get into it definitely by the EFFT piece. Okay, so when it comes to any level of care, um, treatment team, as like was kind of briefly mentioned, is really vital. And when it comes to eating disorders, there's a lot of times can be many different aspects to these treatment teams. I know um, when I have done outpatient, for example, a lot of times I would, if someone especially has been in higher levels of care for eating disorders, I will not would not treat someone unless I did have releases for everyone on their treatment team. Um, so we could appropriately contact each other and get on the same page. Um, and typically the treatment team, and this especially goes through the higher levels of care and a lot of times, um, the majority of these people also are present in outpatient, include individual therapists, um, dietitian, psychiatrist, primary care physician. There are times that um, they, we, especially with adolescents, like they have a therapist they're really attached to who does not have a lot of eating disorder knowledge. So um, I have, it's not ideal or there's limited resources or everyone's booked. I feel like right now, every outpatient provider is so full. Um, and sometimes there can be ways to coordinate with like an eating disorder specialist or get a supervisor um, if needed with that. Not my first recommendation, encourage someone with experience. Um, I've also seen it where um, someone's had their old therapist and they may see them like once a month and work with the ED therapist like weekly. Um, so it's still that little bit of mix, but they need to make sure they're on top of that coordination. Once again, 
doesn't always work out the most effectively, but if you are going to do it, just make sure you're communicating weekly um, to be able to get through it. Um, psychiatrist is um, with eating disorders, a lot of times, especially temporarily, if it's, there can be psychiatry needs and medication needs for um, managing the anxiety to get through meals and get through some of the behaviors. This is not always the case, especially with adolescents. It's typically not the first go-to. It's going, what skills can we teach them first? Maybe DBT um, to help them be able to manage their emotions and what they're struggling with. In reality, sometimes that psychiatrist is needed. Um, working with a primary care physician, hopefully someone who's been able to identify or work with eating disorders, depending on severity is important. But once again, having that release and psychoeducation is really helpful and just like being curious on like what they do know. Um, Cause a lot of times there's a lot of really good primary care doctors and you know, I think as clinicians, how much eating disorder treatment do most people even have in their grad program specifically for mental health? I'm learning, I'm one of the few who actually had an eating disorder class at my um, grad school. It's really rare to get this. And so if you think of a PCP and naturally all the schooling they have to have, a lot of them is eating disorders, even, even the most limited if they don't see it regularly, um, they just need some gentle guidance um, with that approach. I am not shy usually with my gentle guidance. Next slide, Leah. Okay, when higher levels of care are needed. Um, so I don't think this is the one I have a different slide down, no. Um, so when higher levels of care are needed, it depends on the level the eating disorder is impacting um, physically, um, emotionally, socially, school, and all those different areas. Um, and it starts with the most intensive, which is inpatient, which is 24 seven. Someone who is inpatient for an eating disorder. Um, and by the way, a lot of times the suicidality or self-harm sneaks up alongside of it um, throughout treatment or before. Um, inpatient, they typically need medical stabilization or it's very active suicidal thoughts or self-harm that cannot be managed without like a high staffing ratio. A lot of times an inpatient, like they need to do labs daily, a lot of medical checking, um, IVs, things like that is that inpatient level of care. Um, residential level, depending on the residential, um, there can be a little overlap with inpatient, but at residential, they're generally able to eat some food and resist from some behaviors. There's still a lot of interventions like for those who purge like bathroom lockouts after meals, um, things like that. And a lot of some residentials like eating recovery center, we do feeding tubes as well when they're needed. Um, we can do quite a bit there. And like we have nursing 24 seven in our residentials. We have PCPs on staff um, to really keep an eye on those labs and those different pieces in residential. But once again, they're there 24 seven working on it, working with the team um, on meal plan, compliance with meal plan and decreasing the other behaviors. Um, Cause especially for those who get in like the binge, purge cycle, lax laxative usage has to be very closely watched medically um, for like, and there's like water pills as well. Um, for those pieces, they need that lockout and separation from everything to be able to break that vicious cycle of behaviors. Um, partial hospital program, PHP is all day, five to seven days per week. Um, ERCs typically do run and we expect people to come seven days a week at least eight hours is what we have found the most effective for recovery. Um, an intensive health pro patient program IOP is typically about three hours, three times per week. And then of course there is outpatient. Um, and so, as I mentioned, like an assessment. So if you are looking at higher levels of care um, with the ERC, there's an assessment team um, that can get in and do a detailed assessment on you know, what is needed. And I think sometimes there's like a perception of like, oh, treatment centers are always going to get people to like to the highest level. Okay, our dear friends at insurance would not allow that. We have to be very specific on what the needs are for higher levels of care. And it's also not helpful for a person um, if they are placed in the wrong level of care, whether lower or higher. Um, I'll get typically get into a little bit further, but also it's not atypical for someone especially an adolescent struggling with an eating disorder for, you know, for them to go, I promise I'm going to stop. I'm going to stop. It's good. I don't need treatment. I don't need treatment. And to even go through that a few cycles. And when they say that, I really teach parents that they mean it when they say that. That is not a false claim the large majority of the time. And when the eating disorder is really present, 
there are a lot of times aren't going to be able to combat it if they're having numerous behaviors or extreme behaviors like I talked about before. Um, so being mindful with that. Um, and that's why we have the team, as I mentioned in the earlier slide, even an outpatient to really work close collaboration with the adolescents and the pa parents and even the outside like, you know, doctor PCP might be the other part of the treatment team to make sure you're all around the same page. Next. Um, I guess I could probably talk just really quickly um, about this integrated treatment. Um, so treatment teams, um, we, we need our treatment teams to be uh, trained in evidence-based treatment. So motivational interviewing, I use a whole bunch of motivational interviewing here um, because our folks come in the door for their eating disorders, sometimes reluctantly, um, or their mood and anxiety disorders. And the last thing they wanna do is sit down and meet with me um, so really needing to help um, get this lined up with what are their goals and their values and et cetera. Um, so a lot of motivational interviewing. Um, we rely uh, a lot on, on ACT, acceptance and commitment therapy. Um, DBT and RODBT are utilized here. Um, exposure response prevention behavioral activation. So kind of depending on if you're hypo or hyper aroused kind of typically, um, we do one or the other with folks. Um, in some cases, we do prolonged exposure or written exposure. That's usually more at the outpatient levels of care. The written exposure therapy, sometimes um, we're starting that in residential, but it's it, the therapist has to be trained in it, et cetera. Um, cognitive behavioral therapies are used and family treatment, as Jennifer mentioned, and of course um, is, is important to um, our hosts today as well. Um, and then medications that integrate um, these psychosocial interventions with eating disorders and substance use, and that includes anti-craving medications. Um, and then of course, services provided in the same location with the same providers in a stepwise integrated fashion. I can step outside of my office that I'm in right now and go to either side of me and knock on the door of one of our psychiatrists and talk to them directly, which is um, really great in terms of like um, facilitating communication. And then the following uh, positive outcomes, right? So we want to, what are the following outcomes or the positive outcomes for this? And we see reduced substance use when we're engaging in this integrated treatment um, and an improvement in psychiatric symptoms and functioning. We see decreased, decreased hospitalizations, increased medication compliance, um, coping skills um, are gained. Um, we see uh, re-entry to schools and workforce and, and increased performance uh, at both of those. Um, and improve quality of life, which is what we're looking for for our folks. Um, some of the challenges that come with integrated treatment are the facility setup. You know, some we don't have a lot of space, maybe, um, or it can be a little awkward. But really needing to try to work our way around that as much as possible and provide those spaces. It's like a game of Tetris sometimes. Um, making sure that medical needs are met. Um, sobriety monitoring can be challenging um, at times. Um, so we're living communities are great and sometimes they're not always accessible for all of our folks. And then of course we can see family resistance um, where they're, if they're bought into, yes, they need eating disorder treatment. Why are you talking to them about their use of alcohol? That's fine. That's not a problem. Um, so we can see some family resistance as well. All right. Hope is critical. So we often have to hold hope for them, right? Um, for our patients, because a lot of times they come and they don't have it. Um, our services and our treatment goals have got to be patient driven. That doesn't mean that they are the ones completely driving the bus, but they need to be included in this because we get more buy-in when the things are in their own words and that they kind of come up with some of their own goals with our assistance. Um, we have to have unconditional respect and compassion. This is why working on a team is great because there are going to be days when we just don't have it. And so being able to hand the reins over to someone else and, and, um, and give ourselves a little bit of space so that we can continue to delve into that well of compassion. Um, and we're responsible for engaging the patients and, and supporting the recovery and figuring out how to keep them invested, um, which can be very challenging at times. All right. All right. The fun D part. DBT is for me. All right. I did adolescence, perhaps one too many years. Um, some of this I just want to acknowledge, um, especially with the Family Recovery Center's like background in DBT, probably is new, or you're probably gonna be chatting me on like Jennifer, this is old, like this is wrong. That's totally fine. That's part of DBT is it should be very teachable and teachable for others, including our patients. Um, and there's a few things that connect with eating disorders that I thought would especially maybe be helpful um, in kind of ringing home in the connection. So as many may know, DBT, um, look at that 
Leah, it's a Venn diagram. Um, see, that's on my radar now. I have to have a mediation with that friend. Um, DBT talks about three main mind states, emotion mind, um, wise mind, and rational mind. And as we know, a lot of times, especially when someone starts treatment, especially those who start treatment with um, that struggle with an eating disorder or perhaps um, are starting to show some personality traits, tend to start with a pretty large emotion mind. Um, and as many of us know, the, we want to work with most of our life decisions to be operated from more of a wise mind state, which both balances the acknowledgement of the emotions that is vital and utilizing that rational mind, that very logical part of our brain and thinking. And yes, there's going to be times in our life, right, that like, for example, I got a puppy on Sunday from rescue. And I'm so excited about my puppy who is created in another room. Um, so being emotion mind when I got the puppy, like totally makes sense. It's logical. If I was very wise minded about, I got a puppy and like, you know, and like logically going into those reasons, like, you know, my partner might be kind of looking at me like what? Um, and so just want to acknowledge there's times for both emotion mind and rational mind that you do want them to take over a little bit more decision. For example, the rational, logical piece, when you're doing the budget, you probably want to be a little bit more of that rational thinking during that time. Leah, can you hit the next one? So what I like, and I just also want to say most of the stuff has been stuff taught to me over the past 15 years. And so I just want to give credit to those people. I also cannot remember who taught me what. So if this has been seen elsewhere, I am not taking ownership for the large majority of these things. Um, and with the mind states, it was once beautifully mentioned, shown to me um, how so often when someone starts treatment, and this includes eating disorder treatment, they have that big emotion mind, a little rational mind right? And so often when someone's in treatment and starting to work on learning skills and emotion minds, things feel like facts, even though we can sit when we're in a wise mind state going like, eh, that's emotion mind. I'm not sure if any of you treat DBT have ever been like had someone screaming or crying saying they're in wise minded state. Um, that would be an example of that. And what we need to do is work on with that rational mind through the different supports through the treatment team and building different layers around that rational mind to get it to look like the first slide of a little bit more balance with that wise mind in the middle is the goal. Um, and when, like I said, once again, when someone comes to higher levels of care, even if it's not eating disorder, you tend to see this balance in the beginning for a large amount of people. Now, if it's reversed, where it's a big rational mind circle, a little emotion mind, there is a theory, um, I'm not sure how many of you have heard called radically open DBT um, from Tom Lynch, who did work with Marshall Linehan many years ago. Um, and Dr. Lynch like spent many times exploring and researching, I think it was like 20 years for RODBT. It's very different and aimed at those who are naturally more leaning on the over-controlled end of the bell curve um, with their personality. And that if I was going to equate it to this, they're going to be a little bit more in that rational mind piece, although they have their whole different thing. Um, if you're more curiosity on RODBT, you can look it up or um, Eating Recovery Center has groups and Dr. Ellen Astrakhan Fletcher, I always say her name wrong. I've only worked with her for eight years. Um, she's our local like kind of expert on RODBT um, and she often gives talks and are, is very brilliant with those. So I don't know many RO questions. All right, mindful estates and eating disorders. I like to take this concept, this one was me by the way, um, and put in those mind states like this, that when someone's suffering with an eating disorder, um, once again, they can feel very factual and to really struggle to see it sometimes and struggle to see that they're not themselves or not being able to get to a wise-minded place. And what happens is that eating disorder has overtaken that person. And we often separate, and not everyone likes this eating disorder treatment, um, a book that's very helpful for separating eating disorder from person, or if you're new to eating disorders, is called Life Without Ed by Jenny Schaefer. Um, Leah, if you can type that into the chat just so they have it, um, that might be helpful. And that really explains the separation of the eating disorder by person. You're, you're out of control with the, with the advance. This is what happens when we're not in the same room. Um, and so with that, 
that shows like the person, remember how we were mentioning before that even saying you look good can really impact someone. Well, if someone's in their journey, their self is probably still feeling pretty small in their brain compared to their eating disorder thoughts. Um, and that separation is really key and really helpful. So we want to rebuild getting that person back. And in this case, like overflowing that eating disorder, if not completely eliminating that as the circles do adjust. Um, other, other metaphors that are often used is um, there is one that like an alien has taken over the body. Um, especially, I see this, especially with the anorexia and the younger adolescents. Um, when I've worked with families, they're like, this is not my child. Like what is going on? And there's so much parent like shame and guilt of like, what did I do? And like, I swear this is not, you know, what I worked on raising that just shows it's like something has like overtaken the loved one at that point. Um, and that's why there's so much support needed. And that treatment team model is just so vital for approaching it. Um, you really can see that coming out. One of the modalities of eating disorder treatment for adolescents, um, and this is kind of one of the like higher standards is family-based therapy or FBT. Um, it was called in the 90s like Mosley method because it came out of the Mosley clinic in um, London. And that was Daniel LaGrange and James Locke were the creators of that. And in FBT, it's where you really empower the parents. And what's interesting there is in the sessions, because of how they're structured, you really see that eating disorder as a clinician come out and you're really working with the parents and learning to manage that. Um, typically at home, but also treatment centers do incorporate aspects of FBT. Um, we do have like certain aspects of it at ERC in our adolescent as well. All right, next slide. Oh no, it's not working. Okay, um, validation eating disorder. This is a very classic um, eating disorder, um, eating disorder, DBT skill is that validation of that acknowledgement of the emotion statement, emotion mind, and you utilize the word and and not the, the word but. And you'll notice this theme with me throughout that even moves into the EFFT. Um, many people are trained in eat and DBT know that it's natural for us as we're saying something be like, hey, Leah, like, you know, I'm trying to think of an example. I, I know you wanted to have the whole week of Thanksgiving off, but I need you to work because we don't have enough coverage, right? Like even our acknowledge the moment, we stop when we hear the butt. And so just in life, I'm like, let's get the butts out of life in general, well, not physically, that's good physically. We don't wanna judge bodies, but, um, and in DBT, we utilize and, and then you put the rational statement. Um, and with eating disorders, that can be really important as well as acknowledging, I understand in here um, that you feel overwhelmed by dinner and we need to work on those nutrients as we've been working with your treatment team, like to get into your body and let's make a plan around that. Next. Okay, I need to put this down to four. This is controversial. Once again, if you know DBT, um, traditional DBT, the first manual said DBT four options when in distress. If I remember correctly, it's like the adolescent manual on the revisions a few years ago um, added the fifth. And so with the four options in distress, this is something that is helpful. I have found for both patients and parents, especially when it comes to um, whether well, specific problems, but even getting them into higher levels of care of going through the different options. Um, I'm trying to figure out how much I wanna dive into these. I'm just gonna go really, um, I'm like, now I'm debating. Okay, I'm gonna quick do my, my spider story just in case y'all don't know the five, four to five options because um, I find it's hit or mess with people who know DBT. Um, so the five options when in distress can be utilized with many distressful problems. Um, and it can be utilized both going in orders, typically how you know the first two start, but also can be kind of, you can kind of move throughout the different options as well. Um, and so the, my crazy example I like to utilize with this because I find is how people retain it the best is um, I, a number of years ago at one of our old location, we had a reserve behind it. And when it would rain, spiders would come into the building, no matter how much cleaning and pest control. And you should know I'm very arachnophobic. And yes, I should do exposures, but a big part with exposures is willingness and I am not willing. So um, I was running a process group with the adolescents and there was a spider and it had fur on it and it went running across the room and I just about lost it. I would put in some swear words if I wasn't in a presentation right now. And in that moment, I am like pretty much up out of the room, like, hey, we're switching group rooms. 
literally got one of the psychiatrists to like, you need to come deal with this. And the adolescent patients before I could switch group rooms went, didn't you tell us that we need to sit with our exposures and learn? Isn't this your exposure? And I'm like, oh, shoot, they listened. You never know what they're taking away, everyone. You just never know. Like, yeah, wasn't this your exposure? Yeah. And they took a vote and everyone but one other adolescent wanted to stay in the room. Um, by that point, the spider's name was Cinnamon. Um, they had named it. And so I got unlocked my secret can of raid for such a situation. I had it sitting next to me. There was no suicidal adolescence in the room. And the one other one who was struggling, we were on the other side of the room with the can of raid just in case Cinnamon decided to make an appearance again because we could not find him. Like he was so big. How did he disappear? It's amazing what they can get through in the windows, which is another reason. So, okay, my therapy will be after this. Um, so in this situation, I started first by like problem solving, you know, what was going on with the situation, which was like, I wanted to get out of the room. We stayed in the room. I got myself to a chair that I knew I could keep my um, anxiety and check and be able to focus as a clinician and got my safety can arrayed because for whatever reason that made me feel safe. I also had a dust buster there just in case it was needed, although he was too big for that sucker. Why for why? So then I went to changing my interpretation of like what an example like that was for those adolescents. Like how many of them are probably going to remember this big spider named Cinnamon? I mean, he's probably, I'm probably being a little dramatic, maybe just a bit. Um, and working through that and actually seeing a clinician practicing what they preach in those moments. And to me, that's more valuable than any distress I could possibly go through because it was not a life threatening or any, you know, bodily harm being done in that moment. Um, there was the option though, is I could have done nothing and stayed just as miserable in that situation and just like ruminated on and on about the spider, been disengaged from the process group. And that wouldn't have been helpful. And honestly, I really think changing rooms for them also wouldn't have been helpful for them in their treatment and recovery. Um, I did move into a phase of radical acceptance of, I did not like or agree with Sir Cinnamon in the room at that time. And I was choosing not to suffer in it and getting into um, the eye is suffering around that piece. And in the new manual, there's the making it worse. You can make some situations worse, which would have been dropping a bunch of F-bombs and running out of the building screaming, and I probably would have been let go. Um, so that's a super quick example of five options when in distress. But when you have an eating disorder, you're talking about treatment, you can go through with an adolescent or their family. What do these different things look like? When something isn't life-threatening or for example, like depression, a lot of times I acknowledge like they do something and say just as miserably and being under your covers, like bad, like that's an option. We are not gonna judge that. Um, although of course, when there's like certain levels of influence and functions and impacts, you do have to look at a little bit more of the movement. All right, next. All right, that was my short DBT. Now on to EFFT. I need to come up with like a little rhyme for these different things. So um, emotion-focused family therapy was created by Dr. Adele LaFrance um, once again over a number of years. And she was originally um, the FBT family-based therapy. Um, she did a lot of training um, with, I think it was LaGrange. I might be slightly off on that. And really learned that parents and loved ones needed tools for supporting. It started with parents and adolescents on supporting their adolescents and not being therapists, but like just slowing down and acknowledging that emotion. Um, and she created this theory over a number of years and did a lot of research that's been found very helpful. And this is actually the core family therapy approach we utilize at ERC um, because it's very good for those more short-term six to 12 sessions and really giving the families the tools they need. Um, I think one of my favorite things to note is I um, actually hate family therapy. I said I was never going to do it in grad school, yet somehow I did FBT for a number of years, and now I'm presenting on EFFT, and the Dane College professor was right. You always do what you say you're not going to. Um, and this is where I want to get in, like, briefly on um, adolescence, and there sometimes can be adolescents who may be showing starts of like a personality disorder or a little personality flare. Um, and it sometimes can feel like the eating disorder behaviors are being utilized for that attention seeking behavior. Um, that is definitely not, we see that pretty regularly. Um, with that, there's like a few different pieces. One is, do I believe that to be true? That people start out with eating disorder symptoms with the intention to like it's popular, I wanna be the anorexic person or a friend is doing it or just a way to get intention. 
I do think that does happen definitely sometimes. I don't know how deliberate it is sometimes versus others. Um, my experience is, is when there's an adolescent saying that you still have to keep track of like, what is exactly going on with this eating disorder and the behaviors? Because what tends to happen is if you aren't able to get to the acknowledgement piece and that emotion supporting piece, especially with parents, which is a lot of times that second that dairy piece that they don't realize is what they're looking for. Cause usually they're like, I don't want my parents involved. Um, you need to really watch the behaviors because even an adolescent who maybe started out as like a trend or, you know, something that seemed fun, it can still kick in and go into a true eating disorder. And also if they feel like their needs are getting met, even if they cannot acknowledge those needs, even as the family and everyone's like, what is going on here? They can escalate that to a point that there is that medical instability in needing programs. I would say when that is, does happen, that collaboration coordination, um, like we talk with outside providers, unless they tell us otherwise, like once a week typically is really important because those are people that, and if they do end up having to get treatment, you really want to still have those firm boundaries, um, just like other personality disorders with them, firm boundaries, working with family, and they're typically going to have, you're going to want to try to give them a little bit shorter treatment stays when appropriately clinically. Um, the underlying piece to work on even outpatient is definitely family therapy. Um, EFFT is extremely helpful for that and learning to validate and acknowledge the emotion. Um, the other piece I like to do with them is kind of creep in backside. Um, we do a lot of act values work on the values and starting to increase when appropriate, like those activities outside the eating disorder. So sometimes it's still like okay, we're going to acknowledge and still do some meal support and things like that, but not give too much attention, but let's give a lot of positive attention and build out these outside activities and connections with friends. You kind of sneak into it from a backside. This, that in itself is a whole lecture, but that's my really kind of quick answer of like how um, we have approached it and definitely can acknowledge and validate. It's something that is not um, atypical. It definitely does happen. Can you click on the next one? EFFT core beliefs is really important. EFFT is about empowering caregivers that except for in abuse situations, EFFT believes any caregiver can support their loved ones. Once again, there's a few exceptions and they want to, but really caregivers are paralyzed in their fear that they're going to do something worse. And that fear, when we see that as clinicians, um, so this is where I wish I was like an audience. I'm like, have you ever judged a family? And we pretty much all raise our hands. If you don't raise your hand, you either haven't worked with the family or you need to be more vulnerable um, because judgments happen. And that's part of what we work on on clinicians is approaching that non-judgmental stance. And EFFT really wants to empower the caregivers. I have had parents on the spectrum. I've had parents with eating disorders successfully support their adolescents through treatment, um, through empowering them and finding what is their approach in their ways. So the other thing is patients want their caregivers to help them heal, even though no matter how much the adolescent says they do not care, they do not want their parent there. I have to tell you, um, I think I remember Family Recovery Center maybe did multifamily DBT groups um, when I did adolescent stuff up in the North more. Um, but when we had DBT multifamily group, when before COVID hit, there was such a difference between even though we had strict attendance when a parent or parents were steadily present versus if, if they were spotty or not as engaged in the treatment. And even though the adolescents were still there doodling, like looking at the ceiling, um, I can just tell you my observations. You really saw the difference because I saw the parents stopping and spending that time with them and acknowledgement and trying. That even when the parents tried doing the skills and the adolescent would be like, you just learned that in class. Yeah. I did, and I'm trying my best. Um, and so that really supports patients, want their caregivers to help them heal. I've been fortunate enough to been doing this a minute that I've had adolescents come back in their 20s and like thank us and thank their parents. And they were probably some of the biggest like handfuls at the time um, while they were in high school. Caregivers want to support their loved ones to heal, heal. Caregivers can overcome fears that may help them feel paralyzed. Every action has a reaction. Loved ones need to be coached. They did not teach this in parenting school how to support emotion. I think we need this, how to support emotion in like high school before people graduate is just so important. Next slide. Okay, so a lot of times what we see when people come into EFFT is low self-efficacy. And what we see is caregivers having a lot of fear, a lot of self-blame, and feeling very 
disempowered. Um, anyone who does family therapy, you know, even outpatient, I've seen parents like drop off, be like, fix them. Like, I can't do this, fix them. I'm not capable. Right. And in like up until like late nineties and even early two thousands, eating disorders was like hospital model, like drop them off, fix them. And what would happen is the adolescents would go home and immediately relapse. That was part of the birth of FBT actually was that observation of like, what can we do to keep them out of the hospitals all the time? And so that is a very natural reaction for parents because they are scared because of that self-blame, because of their fear that they may do something to make their child worse. They are not dropping them off because they are a bad parent or want to abandon their child. They're just terrified. And we see parents at their worst when they come for therapy, regardless whether it's outpatient or residential. If they're coming in there, there's very few people, although I want to get there in life, who start therapy, especially as an adolescent, just to be mentally healthy and go like a physical each year. We need to do that. And we're getting there, we're getting closer, but usually they're there because something's going on. Um, and when you have this like built, it leads to more and more problematic behaviors because the parents don't know how or they're too afraid to call out the behaviors, to acknowledge the things. Remember the slide with the big eating disorder and the little rational mind, you know, person? Because if they may be prompt of, I noticed he went to the bathroom after lunch, that big eating disorder may blow up at them and yelling and screaming. That's scary. I, I grew up and my family's Norwegian. Like we don't yell. Like my mom could look above her glasses and like scare fear into my heart. If I had an adolescent, you know, yelling at me as a parent, you know, 15 years ago, I would probably be pretty timid as well. Next one. So there's many, many ways. The EFFT training with um, Dr. LaFrance, the basic one is 16 hours and there's week long ones as well. Um, but I do hope to teach you all one or two takeaways for this and still have a few minutes for questions at the end um, if people have them. So how we build self-efficacy is through taking that fear and self-blame and increasing for caregiver empowerment um, through emotion coaching. And that naturally leads to symptom interruption. Um, and emotional support for the adolescent. And one attitude, and by the way, I think we need to just do this next slide um, in life. So if you can hit next slide, Leah, is remembering the power of one degree of change. And Dr. LaFrance talks about if there is a plane going from San Francisco to New York and is off by one degree the whole flight, is that plane gonna land in New York? Now, if you're bad at geometry, like I was, I did not know the answer. And of course the answer is, if you're off by one degree, especially for a long period of time, you're gonna land either in Canada or Florida, right? Um, don't is that quote me on that geography, geometry, even of that, please. It could be Boston or Maine, I don't know. Um, so what they teach in EFFT is even a one little bit of change is still gonna make a long-term impact over time. And so often in life, especially in treatment and recovery, we want everything to magically go away, right? Like DBT teaches, you know, I heard, you know, y'all do that skills phone coaching, right? For those who do work for the eating recovery centers, DBT teaches, even if you can sit at that emotion, not get it worse or, or go down one level, that's huge. And that's life. And that's reality of emotions is a, what we want to do when it comes to emotion coaches is keeping them. If you're on a one to 10 scale and 10 the highest emotion, Okay, if we can monitor that at a seven or eight, which feels a little manageable and keep it from going to a 10, that's amazing. And stopping and observing that is so important. And so that one degree of change prompting as the adolescent gets up to go to the bathroom right after a meal. Hey, remember we talked about no bathroom. That one degree is gonna start consistently doing that impact over a period of time. Is it gonna mean magic recovery skipping off into the sunset? Not necessarily, there needs to be a number one degrees, but it's still a start and it's just so important to recognize all those little pieces. All right, next slide. And so um, I mentioned a few times like the emotion coaching and this is one to really get into all the steps is like a whole three hour presentation in itself. Um, but the one that we're gonna start with um, that is really important is being able to attend to the emotion and learning to recognize the emotion. And as I mentioned on the elevator, you know, that one to 10 skill, getting the elevator a little bit back down and hopefully eventually back to the ground floor. A big piece of that, no, I'm starting to move real fast now, Leah, I'm looking at the time. Next slide. A big piece with a piece with that. Oh, look at our dear friend, Butt is also not an EFFT. 
I need to have this slide just like every two slides throughout the presentation. Um, so it's going to be practicing not utilizing the word but when supporting an emotion. Next slide. So this is the big piece um, with the EFFT that I want people to hold on to in addition to parents can do this and children want their parents to do this. And by the way, I say that because I know we're talking a little bit more adolescent crowd. I've done EFFT with a patient in her 60s and mother in her 80s, right? It doesn't matter the age, you can do this with any caregiver in a life. It can be a partner, it can be a roommate um, with adults. So it's whoever that main support is. And is teaching them how to support the emotion and the first step is attending to the emotion and labeling it before you moved down to problem solving. Problem solving should be less because especially when you have loving, caring, concerned patient parents, their natural goal is to go right to that problem solving. And it's super hard to sit with emotion because um, we don't learn that naturally, right? Unless we're clinicians. And so it's practicing this statement is I can understand why you feel blank and the emotion. And then you support with because three times what you have observed of why they feel that way. And if there's anger, you validate that anger first. And by validating anger, if someone is being really inappropriate, you know, hurting someone, destroying property, things like that, like this is not validating that's okay. It's validating the emotion of the anger. Something that was really unnatural for me in the beginning is the tone and volume are really critical for the effectiveness of this skill. Um, as a clinician, that felt really unnatural to me first. Um, and I'm going to quick give you two examples of this, and then Leah will probably skip that last slide and jump over to you um, with the timing. So two examples of this is when um, I did two rounds of training with Dr. LaFrance, um, probably like five years or so ago now. And I forgot to do my homework and was on the L with my husband. And he like really hated like in grad school and I'd practice everything on him, which I'm pretty sure you're not supposed to do. And so of course I was practicing this with him and one of our other managers was sitting next to me. It's like eight o'clock pre-COVID on the L on the green line heading into the loop. And he's like, kind of like this. And I'm going, you know, he was like cuddled and quiet. Like, I understand why you feel angry at me because you've asked me not to practice my therapy homework because all these people are looking at us because I, you know, and I forget now what the last one was or something like that. It's funny, even though he knew what I was doing, he was kind of like, yeah, like you're correct. Like this is right. Um, the first time I used this with a family was an adolescent who regularly had 911 was being called on numerous times to the week um, to the household. She had been higher levels of care over a year. And the eating disorder was just flaring and we were getting ready to move her up to residential um, at the time again, she was in PHP at that moment. And I finally worked with parents and we made an agreement. I'm like, I've learned this theory. I would like to try it and spend the first part of the sessions practicing this theory and then doing our firefighting at the end. Cause just doing the firefighting is not making that one degree change. Ah, ah, see how it works. Um, it's not making enough change. We're just sitting in the moment versus getting, be able to move forward on this. And I worked with this and mom was really skeptical, but I really emphasize, especially that tone volume piece, even though I was also a little skeptical, to be honest. And they came back a few weeks later. It wasn't like a, you know, one and done. And mom went, it worked, it worked. And basically daughter was escalating after dinner and was like yelling and screaming and like it was starting to look like the elevator's going up and we're almost at 10, um, which is like calling the police. And um, mom like stopped and like yelled the anger back at the daughter. I can understand why you're angry because you've been in treatment over a year because you've lost out of gymnastics because you haven't been able to see your friends and observe those things. And the daughter kind of went like, yeah, like very mom described as matter of factly. And then the moral of the story is they would skip you off in the sunset and everything was perfect or not. What happened is the daughter was probably at like an eight or nine. They were able to get her down those few notches low enough that she was able to eat her meal. And honestly, she did not step up to res, at least in the treatment stay with us. And the police were not called again after that. Now, did the daughter still regularly escalate, yell, things like that? Absolutely. She still got up there quite a bit. Um, and that one degree for that family, when mom and dad learned how to support the emotion and that vulnerability to try it, which is so huge, it was a big change for them. Okay, I'm going to take one minute on this last slide for me, Leah. 
Um, another piece with EFFT I encourage researching looking up is talking about this tree um, and utilizing it for both parents and adolescents that so often our roots are buried in fear, grief, helplessness, shame, self-blame, and hopelessness, but it comes out in these denial, avoidance, rejection, accommodation, enabling, blame, and defensiveness is what we see. And when you see those things above where the leaves are, remember what is going on below and working even with the tree metaphor with both patients and families can be really helpful in a non-blame way to help with it. There's so much more, but that is where I'm gonna leave it for the EFFT. Leah, take it. All right, um, I, just really quickly, these guidelines for effective treatment um, that are you know have been adapted for eating disorders. Um, and so really understanding that these are complex but treatable conditions. Uh, they affect our brain functioning and behavior. Um, and there's no single treatment that is appropriate for all individuals. We, you know, we have a basic idea of uh, you know, the foundation, but then you know, we have to decide what color to paint the rooms. And so it, that's really gonna depend on the patient's needs, their family's needs, et cetera. The big, the, one of the big keys is treatment needs to be readily available. Um, and so uh, uh, they're often reluctant to seek treatment and prevention is really important as we talked about with those sub threshold kind of identifying things early on. Um, and, and so making sure that we are covering our bases. And again, we don't have to be the expert in all the things, but we have to have an awareness of so that we can recognize something that needs to be managed by an expert. Um, effective treatment tends to the multiple needs, not just the eating disorder or the substance use disorder. We wanna make sure that we're addressing everything. Um, remaining, here's the big one, right, with insurance. Remaining in treatment for an adequate period of time is crucial for treatment effectiveness. And we all know this and feel frustrated at times when we feel that someone's stay has been cut short um, and uh, we just continue to do our best to fight the good fight there. Um, group, individual, family counseling, nutritional counseling, other behavioral therapies are critical components um, of effective treatment for both disorders. And, you know, what was some of the reason for that is that, you know, eating disorders very easily hide behind substance use disorders and vice versa. And so we really need to be providing um, the, this treatment for all of all the things. Medications are an important element of treatment for many patients, um, especially when combined, right, with counseling and other behavioral therapies. That's kind of the gold standard for most people. Um, our treatment, our uh, patient service plan uh, has to be assessed continually and then modified as necessary to ensure um, that we're meeting their changing needs. I think one of the complaints that comes from a lot of patients when they, when they get here is, I feel worse than before I enter treatment. And that's because their needs are changing as we're peeling back the layers of the onion as they don't have access to their numbing uh, mechanisms, et cetera. And so really being able to address things that pop up that maybe they've been suppressing for a long time. Medical detoxification is the first stage of addiction treatment. Um, and that's not gonna change long-term drug use. I've worked with a lot of patients who've had several, several, several detoxes throughout their lifespan and have never done treatment once. And that's probably why they've had several detoxes. Um, and the same thing, weight, uh, weight restoration, the normalization of eating patterns, the elimination of compensatory behaviors is only the first stage, not the fifth stage, <laughs> mm, the first stage of recovery uh, from eating disorders. Treatment doesn't need to be voluntary in order to be effective. I think that um, external motivation gets a bad rap, quite honestly. Um, and I think a lot of times we hear this idea or our patients or clients are told this idea that unless you're internally motivated, you're never gonna get in recovery. Well, I think that's BS. I have seen plenty of people get into recovery with external motivation. The idea is that over time, they start to gain some of that internal motivation. And sometimes even with internal motivation, there still needs to be external stuff going on. So it doesn't have to be voluntary for it to be effective. You never know what someone's going to absorb when they're going to absorb it. ED related behaviors and drug use during treatment have to be monitored continuously and dealt with. Um, and of course, we have to uh, test for the presence of HIV AIDS, hepatitis B and C, tuberculosis, other infectious diseases, et cetera. And there we go, we've got some information for both Jennifer and myself, if you have additional questions. I'm also gonna type um, our PRL, uh, our Public Relations Liaison, Terry um, Sandejas, uh, her information as well, if you needed to reach out uh, to speak with her, um, I'll put her email in there. Anything you wanna add, Jennifer? No, um, send us, I do have to jump off right at um, like 11.59. Um, but yeah, we have a few minutes for any other questions and also feel free to email us um, any questions that you might have.
I want to note that Nina um, mentioned pro-dependence by uh, Robert Weiss, um, and it is true. We do kind of vilify um, uh, folks who, you know, accusing them of being enablers, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so our approach here, we actually have a group that addresses um, like kind of relational patterns in within our ARCH programming. And um, we, it used to be called codependency, and then we shifted the name to relationships and recovery because, you know, codependency can be a part of it for some people, and we make sure that we don't vilify that. We really recognize that there are strengths that come from those folks who are caregivers, and it's kind of human nature to want to do for somebody and, and relieve people from pain, et cetera. So codependence is a bit newer. It's a teeny bit controversial, but so are lots of new things, and I think it's very much the same thing with reading about codependence, interdependence. We take what we need what's helpful and we leave the rest, right? So um, that's a really great refreshing look as well. So thanks for mentioning that. Any additional questions that have come up, feel free to pop them in. Might've gotten one more comment here. The PowerPoint, um, um, it sounds like the training will be up on the Family Recovery Center's site. Unfortunately, we're not able to yeah. release the PowerPoint, but if there's specific things you have questions on, shoot us an email, we'll make sure you get the resource yep. and what you need there but you'll and have also thank you all i really especially yeah. appreciated all the questions and extra resources going throughout um it's just so important that i i hate the word expert by the way i'm like you're an expert when you've done something for 50 years but i appreciate everyone adding things and putting input because no one person knows everything and trainings like this and how we help each other is how we learn and grow so thank you so much yeah, yeah i want to thank everybody as well Enjoy your weekend or your week. Oh my gosh, it's only midweek. Enjoy the rest of your week. <laughs> it's Wednesday, Leah. I know. All right. Thanks, everybody. Awesome. Thank you, guys. Awesome presentation. We appreciate you guys. Thank Our you pleasure. so much. Anytime. All right. Take care, guys. All right. Bye-bye.